cloud. Hello, friends. I want to welcome Sheila Cochran today. And as we are getting ready to um, share our lunch and learn, uh, we open the floor to any announcements. So I'll begin with an announcement, and I'm sort of recruiting you. Uh, Sherry Egan was one of the first to show up, and she said in the league she's trained to help register voters. So um, we are going to register METC voters, and it's been a while with COVID that we've been able to do this. So um, it's going to be Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday for the next four weeks. Not this week. We start on February 22nd. And our last day is March 17th, which is a high holy day for the Irish. That's it. And um, <laughs> we have some good, well-trained people who, if you haven't been recently trained or you're a little intimidated, there will be some people who are more experienced from the league and just people who uh, are in the community helping to register students. This is gonna take place from 11 to one, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, so check your calendar. Are you free any of those days? It's especially good for people like Sheila who know METC very well, but anyone is welcome. And um, we will give you free parking. Um, you have to ask me or ask my friend David Weingrad for a parking permit, which you use when you check out. Um, Peggy is eating a salad, but I'm going to invite her or Lorna to see if they have any league announcements or community activities. Oh, good. Judy's ready. Judy, can you unmute? So this is Judy Lindquist. Searching for her unmute button. <laughs> okay. Is it just at the downtown MATC or other Thank branches? You. It's just downtown. Once we learn how to do this better, we're hoping to open it up to our other campuses. But right now we're focused on the downtown campus. Thank okay, you, Judy. Thank you. Yep. Um, this Lorna? is Lorna and I'm eating leftover Cincinnati chili, so I'm not putting myself <laughs> on the screen either. But uh, just remind- It is a lunch. It is. Bring it is a lunch. lunch and learn, okay? Right. So um, just remember that it's primary voting day today. And I would primarily, um, not primarily, but, you know, strongly encourage anybody who lives in Milwaukee to vote particularly because of the mayor's race. So just a little reminder in case we forget what day it is. Thank you. Um, I also want to ask a clarifying question on that. I walked by a ballot box in Tosa and it said this ballot box is not functioning. And so I wondered. I know this has been a controversy about whether we'll be able to take our ballots to a ballot box. Um, does anyone know? It seems like we can in Milwaukee, but does anyone have any more information about the ballot box question? You can for this election in February, <clears throat> maybe not, maybe not for April. Um, I wonder if I'm, I'm just guessing here, but if in Wauwatosa they use the same box for utility bills and other things, and maybe that's an issue, I, I don't know. Okay, I'll try to get more information. I am just so disappointed that there's been these voter suppression issues to keep people from easy voting. Okay, um, I do not see anyone raising their hand with more announcements. So I just wanna welcome everybody and, um, We'll do a really quick check-in and then I'll introduce Sheila. So uh, since this is the day after Valentine's Day, anybody want to share? What are you loving or who are you loving and what's giving us hope? So I'll start. Um, one of the people who gives me hope is Pardeep Kaleka. Pardeep is the um, director of our interfaith. And on Saturday, we actually went to a protest trying to make sure that the Afghan families are given the money that they need to feed their families. And Pardeep gave one of his beautiful speeches. So um, in addition to that, Pardeep has worked with us in something called Peace and International Issues Committee. And we have another luncheon series. It's always about the lunch. And that's gonna be the five Tuesdays in March. 
later I'll put this in the chat or feel free to call me later and I'll put my phone number in the chat as well. So anyone else want to tell us who you've been loving or who gives you hope? Oh, I'll pipe in if nobody else is. Um, I, I appreciate all the speakers that have appeared in this program, the Lunch and Learn, um, just to see how many people care about this community and the hard work they're doing to make things better. That gives me hope. And um, one who I'm loving now is my cockapoo, who's convalescing next to me. He had to have surgery. She had to have surgery. She's got to wear that stupid cone mm -hmm. for two weeks. And I feel so sorry for her. And she's been uh, crying herself to sleep at night, oh. not because of pain. We know that's very controlled. That's the distress of being apart from us and she can't do stairs and all that. So oh. anyway, so uh, extra, extra loves going out to her. <laughs> yep. I saw a cute comment the other day. It's like, I don't usually brag about places that I've been that cost a lot of money, but she said, but I just got home from the veterinarian. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Okay, I don't think that was a good checking question. So let me tell you why we were so happy that Sheila said yes. Um, as we promoted the program, Sheila has been a longtime community leader and she's a wonderful organizer. She's not afraid to ask people for money. And so she has worked with um, the labor community uh, doing fundraising for United Way and is the past co-chair of United Way, which took a lot of courage <laughs> to take that one on too. Um, many of you know, she's the retired secretary treasurer of the Labor Council and they really hated it when she was ready to retire. Um, I knew her through her leadership of the board at MATC, the board of directors, and she's been a social justice activist in many ways that intersect. And so um, I'm going to now let Sheila begin. Sheila, will you be sharing a screen at all? No, I, <laughs> I wish I knew how to do it, Pat. <laughs> my, my, uh, I think I'm at the top of my game right now because I have uh, six or seven <laughs> squares in front of me, so I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. Um, so why don't you just tell us some of the things that have uh, shaped you? And one of the questions we frequently ask people is, do you remember what was your birthday when you joined the movement? What is your movement birthday? When did you get active in whatever you would define as the movement for justice? Wow. Let me think. Uh, I think that activism was spurred in my brain uh, at two different times. Uh, one that was very, uh, I think they were around the same time. And uh, I didn't know that was the question you were gonna ask me, but, I, <laughs> uh, but I'll frame it this way. Uh, I first voted for John Kennedy as president on behalf of my mother. Uh, somewhere in that time frame, and I can't remember if it was the 60s, but I do remember the scariest thing uh, that happened uh, that I saw on television because I am a, I was born in 1950, so I am a TV brat. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember very clearly uh, when uh, Nikita Khrushchev said, we will bury you. Yeah. And that was one of the most uh, frightening uh, for whatever age I was at the time, I should look it up. I was one of the most frightening things that I had heard from a foreign leader. And the thing that really or moved me or shifted me uh, in the person was probably my mother mm -hmm. and on several different occasions. Um, I never saw her, my mother was a very, uh, how do I put it? She was a she was a steel magnolia from the <laughs> word go. 
So tears didn't enter her eyes very often. She was very, uh, she was a very uh, loving woman, but she was also a constant repetitive teacher. And uh, I remember I was uh, between, I went to Green Bay Avenue School at the time and between school and home, uh, we've heard about uh, President Kennedy. And it was one of my friends at school that told me the president had been shot. Yeah. But I had never seen my mother cry until that day. Yeah. And she cried and she vacuumed and she cried and she vacuumed. I remember it. I mean, she didn't like to vacuum either. And I mean, she really, she, I mean, it was a big old Kirby. So she was really pushing it. And that was, that was what I saw. The second time that was very profound with me, with her was when she donned a pair of pants uh, at about five or six o'clock in the morning and uh, went to a picket line, picket signs in hand, going to the uh, La Follette Street School where she had become a teacher's aide of sorts. She was a library aide there. And they were fighting for uh, union representation. And that was when aides had just been accepted into um, school. And her constant lessons always were, uh, to me, I mean, like it was, it was drilled in my head uh, that I had to vote. I always had to vote, uh, not to miss a vote. And so to the best of my knowledge, I have never missed an election until, I don't know if it was, it was I think it was the, this past year's primary when I was thinking that a ballot was coming to my house and I didn't make a primary election. And other than that, I've never missed an election. Wow. So she has been and had been uh, uh, the voice in my head when it came to that kind of thing. So advocacy was something that she not only demonstrated, but she was, she was your traditional, at least in, in my life. And what I would say is the, the tradition of black women that I was brought in upon, she worked, she took care of her home, uh, she was active in her church. She did a lot of things uh, for people and she never stopped doing that. Uh, she died in 2019 on November the 2nd and she was the beautiful age of 94. Wow. So that was that. Yeah. She did a good job uh, raising you. Yeah, very. Um, so she's not the only voice in my head. I think the voice in my head that drove me literally through my uh, activist career, however, and doing things to prove my worth was the, my father's voice in my head. He was extraordinarily disappointed with me when I did not um, go to college. And uh, I, all through, I graduated from Rufus King High School. I graduated in the summer of 1969. And he, although it was not outspoken in our home and she, and he didn't say, you know, I want you to go to college and this kind of thing. It wasn't drilled in his head like my husband drilled it in my daughter's head. Uh, it was something he expected. But unfortunately, via a lack of communication, uh, I didn't know. And when I announced that I was not going, uh, I think I got the worst to this day tongue lashing from any bird body that I ever have received. So once I started working and once I uh, started to do things in my head, I know now very clearly that it was that driver that I will prove that mm -hmm. I was uh, as a friend of mine, Gwen Moore likes to say that I'm worthy of the air that I breathe on this God's earth. So mm -hmm. uh, that, that was it. And those are the two people. And then along the way, there've been a lot of different friends and advocates that I have worked with and uh, too many to name, but a few in particular that just really have spurred me forward. Having said that, uh, I will say that, uh, and I realized how different this might sound to some people. Um, I was an extraordinarily shy uh, girl. And to some degree, I still am. I, I am a, 
introvert from the word go, I'll stay home and be just as happy as a clam. But I had to be asked to do things. I, but what I didn't learn uh, early enough was how to say no. And so every time someone asked me to do something, I would do it. And if it was something that uh, I that I really uh, felt passionately about, I would continue to do it. So there isn't anything uh, that I have done uh, from uh, from the jobs that I have and had to uh, even being. A, I mean, I was begged to be on the MATC board. I think. Oh, it's I'm so sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that there. Uh, uh, some of our union leadership there was a little chagrined once I got on because <laughs> the one thing that usually has, the one thing that has happened to me over time, and I don't know if this is true of any of your other speakers before, but uh, the tendency to want to, uh, I think, uh, in, in some way uh, diversify organizations, leadership and whatever, uh, we've been asked to sit in places and sit on boards because of our skin color and our uh, sex. However, uh, our voices were not necessarily what uh, was expected, at least if it didn't have a differing opinion of our fellows that ask us there. And I found uh, a, an interesting uh, thing over the time that I've done all this stuff. And that is that for the most part, uh, when people would ask me who were my greatest antagonists, and I would say, you know, it's not the usual suspects. I said, quite frankly, it has become my liberal progressive brothers. They drive me nuts <laughs> because they did not want to hear the opinions that I really had when I had them. I think they were happy with me being there, but wanted to say, you know, this is the path we're taking. And I would sometimes uh, take a different path. Mm -hmm. And I didn't do anything uh, that I wouldn't have done. It was just that we didn't often agree. And when we didn't agree, uh, they didn't see that there was not only uh, a black woman sitting there, there was someone who had had a lot of life experience that told me that this was not exactly uh, the way that I think we should go. Mm -hmm. And uh, that happened to me more often than uh, you have time to hear. <laughs> so um, it, uh, and it didn't matter the position I was in, but uh, it also, uh, I am not only my mother's daughter, I'm very much my father's daughter. And so I, the tone of not being, uh, not, you know, not wanting to have someone constantly uh, degrade or whatever came from him. Uh, he, he was a very quiet man, but when he spoke, he spoke volumes. And I would often uh, sit in meetings, no matter what organization I was affiliated with, and I would listen uh, because I wanted to learn. Uh, again, you know, not having gone to college, I would have a lot of, I thought very smart people sitting around me uh, and uh, I didn't want to say or do the wrong thing, but I often found that common sense was lacking in an awful lot of conversations. And so uh, I remember sitting in, and since all of these organizations still exist, I won't uh, go into too much detail, but I will say that I was sitting in a very large meeting one day and uh, a strategic plan had been presented and the president of this organization had done a lot of work along with the staff to make sure that they had touched every nut and bolt of the entire organization. It was a lot of work that needed to be done. And uh, she was new. And uh, with all of these people sitting around and I'm listening, uh, they got down to a conversation about the purchase of uh, hardware, just simple computers mm -hmm. and of all things, cell phones. And uh, at one point, one of the, uh, <laughs> I would like to say captains of industry in the room said, well, you know, well, what about, uh, you know, we, we can donate these and we can do this and that. And I sat there and I listened to this. And at some point uh, I was just sitting there and I raised my hand and I said, excuse me. I said, you know, junk is junk. I think we can <laughs> afford to purchase computers 
I said, and who in here doesn't have an organization with more than one cell phone? I mean, this is ludicrous. And so as I sat there and I said it, uh, I saw a few smiles and then uh, I saw a couple of people kind of sit back in their chairs as if they had been spanked or something. And, and they said, yeah, I guess that does make sense. Well, we had been, I think we had spent by that time about 20 minutes on this conversation. And that was, if anything else, it was, it was so obvious to me, it was incredible. And uh, while I was sitting there, I got a text message on my phone. And uh, one of the lawyers in the room said, good for you. And I was like, well, what's wrong with you guys? For God's sake, I mean, speak up. <laughs> so that has happened to me a lot. And uh, so I learned that the life experience I had over time was quite equivalent to the learning that others had. So then I just stopped thinking about it. Uh, and I did, uh, I would tell people every once in a while, I would assume the position of sitting back and listening, especially when I'm sure like everyone who's listening to me now on this uh, Zoom call uh, knows as a woman, you get ignored. Mm -hmm. And as a black woman, you get ignored more until you open up your mouth. So of course, you know, that earns us titles that I don't really care about, but in, quite frankly, have never cared about. The point in fact is, uh, as uh, we often tell people these days, when you see something, say something, if it's mm -hmm. right or wrong. And so I think that is what uh, I brought to the table more often than not. But that also meant that sometimes I disagreed with the very organizations that I was uh, leading as far as leadership. Uh, it did not mean that I was always, uh, and I never would claim victim status. That's, I, I, I don't, I, I'm not one of those that is, going to say that, but I am going to say uh, that I have been, uh, no matter what position and no matter where, disregarded uh, and overlooked. And uh, I think that just comes with people's lack of knowledge and lack of understanding, because we all have something to contribute. Mm -hmm. uh, I have looked at and listened to an awful lot of uh, people over time, and I will find uh, people that I learn from in every walk of life. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, at one point kind of chastised because I hadn't been to church and I can't remember when. And uh, a friend of mine said, well, you know, you need spiritual advisors. And I said, well, how do you know I don't have them? I said, quite frankly, I said, dealing with the labor movement, I have more than one. I said, I have one that's, I said, I have a couple that are Catholic. I said, there's one that is uh, a, a street minister. And I said, and more than one uh, that is uh, black or whatever. And I said, and I learned from all of them. And quite frankly, it has been my saving grace sometimes because uh, one or two in particular, one in particular, uh, who would every once in a while, just out of the clear blue sky pop up in my office. And I would say, wow, I needed to see you today. I didn't know it, but I do need to see you today. Yeah. And so I think that we uh, draw our experiences as uh, black people from not only our heritage and not only uh, the work that we've done and whatever, but that sense of, um, I think, Common sense runs through a lot of us when it comes to things. Uh, injustice has become so prevalent in our lives until we, you know, we end up picking and choosing the ones that we really want to fight for. And quite frankly, uh, you know, when um, the entire Black Lives Movement uh, started, uh, someone asked me, so why is this so important? <laughs> I said, because quite frankly, no matter in, I said, you know, I said, as a black woman, I can tell you that this has happened my entire life. Mm -hmm. I said, but seemingly uh, the whole world or you know, everybody else has to see it to believe it. I said, we're just totally uh, looked upon, quite frankly, as just lying about things. Yeah. And I said, so I don't know how and why at this point in time you think that this isn't necessary. I said, to really, 
eradicate and which will probably, I don't know, maybe in several lifetimes from now, become uh, a little bit different, but I don't think so. Uh, but to eradicate this notion that, uh, I mean, I grew up in people would literally like, they, they thought our skin color would rub off on them. And uh, I worked with a gentleman one time, I took my wedding ring off and it had a rather wide band. And he said, what is that on your finger? And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, that, that, that white streak. I said, it's a tan line. And uh, he said, wow. Uh, so they're those things that we learn from each other just by being around each other. But you know, when you don't know, you don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that is something that uh, happens. And I, I, <laughs> I owe my, uh, I owe my, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> uh, my election, because uh, the secretary treasurer's job for the labor council was an elected position. I owed my election to a bigot. Mm -hmm. uh, I was nominated by my local union president and uh, this gentleman jumped up and uh, when I was nominated and he said enough of this diversity as if the labor council had had any by that time. Whoa. And uh, he disagreed with the nomination and he said he was going to nominate uh, actually one of my fellow UAW union brothers who had already said he was going to support me. And it was in the front of a crowd of, I don't know, about six or 700 delegates at the time. Whoa. Because our meetings used to be fa fairly large, maybe maybe more like five, I think. But it was a, it was a nominating meeting, so it was a big deal. And um, he embarrassed the white men in the room so much. Mm -hmm that uh, after the meeting, and I, you know, I still accepted my nomination very graciously. I was very blessed to have been a UAW member and it wouldn't have mattered had I not gotten the nomination because I had a job to go back to. Right. And uh, I, you know, I, was doing, I was doing it because again, I was asked and uh, I was approached after the meeting. And uh, at the time, the president of the Building Trades Council told me he was, that that was absolutely outrageous and the man had totally embarrassed him and blah, blah, blah. And this went on for a couple of minutes. I said, it's fine. It was one of the first times I think that overt bigotry yeah. uh, was shown before an entire group of people and it was in their face. Mm -hmm. And I've known all my life that if it is in your face, uh, you have two choices of how to deal with it. You can either try and get rid of it, or you can do something about it, or you can continue to ignore it, or you can bathe in it, but you've got choices and you need to do something about those choices. So I don't think I- good time shopping. I said I bet you don't have good time shopping. I don't think. I don't think. Sorry. Sorry, Sheila. Yeah. I don't think that there's been a time where uh, that hasn't had to be. Uh, it, if it's not, you know, if it's, it's like a tree fa uh, falling in the forest. Mm -hmm. You know, if you didn't hear it, did it happen? I mean, you could see it laying down there. You figured it fell down, but you weren't there when it happened. So I think people have kind of taken that attitude. And as long as I was at the Labor Council, uh, I was going to make sure that the things that I did coincided with not only uh, the labor movement, which is my job to deal with, uh, but also to put some things forward that we had to deal with. And I think my greatest test of that uh, was in 2006 when uh, for the Labor Day Parade, I said, okay, to Latino workers marching in tandem in our uh, parade. Uh, it was the day that it was the first time that I had the full, uh, you might know I got elected with John Goldstein and mm -hmm. our president had uh, at that time because of uh, Act 10 or not the Act 10 at that time, it was uh, some downsizing at the National AFL. Uh, we had to go to one officer and John left. And so I was the remaining officer. And I think that when that happened, my board of directors uh, was uh, a little afraid. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, my dear sister, uh, Candace Alley saying, uh, 
what do you want your title to be? And I said, I'll just keep it with the way it is because mm -hmm. it, I said, it's just too much paperwork to be changing it around. So they added a couple of initials behind it and I was in charge and that was it. But my first test was that 2006 uh, Labor Day. Uh, and uh, I will tell you that uh, the hate uh, for uh, brown and mm -hmm. black people is very strong. And uh, I was, uh, it was, it was hammered every day uh, from the time um, a gentleman went, uh, one of our union brothers went uh, on channel four and stood on his front lawn and started to talk about these quote unquote illegals marching in the parade. Oh, yeah. But we did, uh, we coordinated that thing. It was a huge pouring, uh, outpouring of uh, Latino workers. The AFL-CIO, which I represent in this, it represented in Milwaukee, Milwaukee County, Ozaki, Washington County. Uh, the Labor Council is the, uh, the national representative of the body in the county. And so this was not a choice. This was the way things were going to be. And we had uh, just elected Linda Chavez Thompson as our executive vice president of the national AFL-CIO. And she and I had had conversations about you know, all the work that had been done in trying to diversify and, and bring in more Latino workers. We knew we had a lot of workers who did, that were undocumented. Uh, but they came here, and this was my, this was uh, where I fell uh, on the sword because I told uh, someone, I said, look, I said, when, when people come here and they come here to work, this is a labor movement. I said, a lot of these people are in our, in our midst, they are in our workforces, and we can't go through uh, policing one by one who may or may not be here because they were employed by employers. I said, the law is clear. It's the employer's responsibility. I said, and our responsibility is to make sure they're treated like human beings. Amen. I said, so as far as I am concerned, I said, this is what we're going to do. And we, uh, there had been no pushback from our board of directors when I first brought it to them because trust and believe there's very little that happens in the labor movement that is not supposedly agreed upon by the body. But there are those voices in the body, just like in the larger community that do not agree. And sometimes their voices are heard louder than the ones who agree. And I had no disagreement up to that point. Uh, all of a sudden there was disagreement, but I looked at it as a logistics problem because mm -hmm. that's all it was. I had no fear that anything would happen. Uh, we worked very closely with all of the people that we always do, including uh, the police department and the powers that be. And I feel that uh, some of the most hateful phone calls uh, from people uh, from middle August all the way up until Labor Day. And I told my staff, I said, the really nasty ones you send to me because I didn't want them to have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And everyone, uh, I don't, I don't know what people thought, but I literally had a, labor, a lady call me and tell me that there were gonna be riots in the street and these people didn't know how to act and just all kinds of things. But it was a perfect day. I can tell you that when that throng of people marched through the, uh, to the gates of the festival grounds, I stood there in tears because it was one of those moments that I said, this, is, this was worth every minute of it. Oh, yeah. Not only was it peaceful, uh, a lot of them who had walked all the way to the festival grounds turned right around and walked all the way back because they knew that there were people there that didn't want them there. And wow. um, that to me was unfortunate. A lot of people did come in. Uh, I think that more people wanted them there than did not want them there. Uh, we didn't have any problems that day. And it was a wonderful experience for, I think, uh, those of us that had enough sense to enjoy it. And so it was one of those things that uh, I just said, this is one of those moments where I don't back down. Yep. Uh, you know, we had people that tried to make it painful thereafter, but we had other people that tried to make up for that pain. And I was grateful for that. And I didn't have any more significant issues after that until Act 10. 
Uh, and uh, I can tell you that the largest group of people affected by Act 10 were black workers in the city of Milwaukee yep. uh, who had jobs uh, in the public sector. Mm -hmm. And the killing part about that is that the people who were affected by it, mm -hmm. uh, it was not something you could immediately feel until you looked around and found out that your union had been decimated to the point where you had very little leadership left, uh, grievances went unanswered, uh, your rights eroding because you uh, no longer had a contract that was enforceable or you, you know, your union dues weren't being collected mm -hmm. uh, as they were before. And so you didn't know what, you know, and you didn't have enough people, enough staff people to actually come around and collect those dues or to tell you how to redo things. And I know you understand this uh, with what has gone on with AFT. Mm -hmm. So where you don't have a, a very active and cohesive group of people who are uh, there for each other, uh, they kind of fall apart. And where you have different union structures, this, the, these things happen. But we lost black leadership and we lost black members in the city. We lost them in the school system. We lost them because one of our professional unions that was affiliated with the labor council uh, was a supervisors and um, principals union. Mm. Uh, and so we lost them. Uh, and that was the most professional union uh, that had the most probably black professionals in one area uh, that we had had, along with any number of clerical workers and uh, county workers, you name it. Uh, and, you know, there's a double-edged sword there because uh, I don't remember all of this, but uh, I was told that, you know, in order to work for Milwaukee County in the first place, if you were black, they had filed a lawsuit. I know that there was a lawsuit filed within the fire department, but um, now uh, what happens? And so uh, these are the people that were taking care of indigent, they were taking care, I mean, they take care of Milwaukee County. Yep. So we had losses in places where we didn't even want to say out loud, honestly, because it was so drastic. Public sector workers were in the building trades, they were in in every sector you can imagine in this state and in this city and in the counties. And so it was a huge loss. Uh, and uh, that was probably one of the greatest losses we had when it came down to workers. And every so often I would get a phone call from a worker who would say, you know, well, I called my union and I don't know who to talk to. And I said, well, I'm sorry to let you know that, you know, that union is no longer able to have leadership because right. they, you know, I said it, and it's, it's odd because this was the first time people started to understand what their union dues paid for. And when I said it paid for your staff, they will say, well, what are they doing now? I said, well, they've, they've been let go. Right. Some of them are doing other jobs. So it's, it's one of those things where I think that, uh, I, I think slowly, although I don't, it, it's not being talked about right now, I think because of the pandemic and God knows what else going on, um, that there's growth in the labor movement. And I, I hope that I'm right about that. There are signs of uh, growth in places where I wouldn't have thought there would be. I understood mm -hmm. that, you know, there's something in Starbucks and, you know, there have yeah. been a couple of, couple of issues around Amazon. Right. And, uh, I will say that uh, the, uh, the, even though the UAW in the state of Wisconsin, my union is uh, much smaller than it used to be. Those jobs that uh, have been being talked about here lately, those 1000 jobs going to wherever they're going, uh, those would have been UAW jobs had they mm -hmm. stayed and those were very good jobs. So, uh, we have a lot of cross connections when it comes to labor and black people. We also have a lot of discrimination within that because we are a microcosm in every workplace of whatever the employer hires. And so where you have uh, discriminatory practices inside of a facility, be it a school, a factory or whatever the heck it is on the job, on a construction site, 
it is because the employer has not really embraced and forced the idea of being very intentional about having every worker respected for who they are. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, when it has come to discrimination and the things that I have worked on, and there have been an awful lot of them, uh, it, it's, it starts there. Uh, and it starts at home. It starts on how people are trained and what they're taught. And uh, we were not, my mother never taught us uh, to discriminate. Uh, there were things that could not be said in her home. There are things that couldn't be said in my home. And uh, we treated people fairly. I was fortunate enough to grow up around different types of people. Uh, in 1950, 53206 was a very integrated zip code. Right. Right. And uh, I lived in a very integrated neighborhood, even though I lived around a lot of black people. I also lived around a lot of uh, other people. I remember, you know, a lot of Jewish people, I think Polish people or Slavic something or other. But there was, at least in my very early uh, years, I don't remember what I know about now. Obviously, uh, there's an awful lot of it. The home that I live in currently, I had to fight tooth and nail to get in. Uh, it was <laughs> owned by a nice little Jewish lady who did not understand that uh, once I put down earnest money, it meant that I could have this house. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it took it took a minute to get in here. <laughs> it took six <laughs> it took six months. But I told my wow. husband, "This is the house I'm dying in," and I meant every word of it. I think that we over time have to break. There's so many different things. Uh, I mean, you know, people talk about the codicils that were written into law and mm -hmm. the things that aren't in law and the things that we assume, etc. I think the more information that people have, the better. But it's also very confusing information because you sometimes don't know where to start. And I can tell you that the, the first civil rights activity that I took on outside of my own uh, comfort zone and outside of my own uh, work facility uh, was with bank redlining. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, so I was, I worked with the Fair Lending Coalition for a long time. Uh, I was appointed at some point in time by John Norquist to uh, the Fair Housing and Employment uh, Commission. And uh, it had teeth. Mm -hmm. And I found out then how you take the teeth out of any organization. You stop funding it. You can't, yep. you know, you can't pay a lawyer, you can't pay staff, and then you have a volunteer uh, bunch of commissioners, and you just stop doing the work that you're doing. And so uh, that led me into the work that we were doing with the Fair Lending Coalition. But it also taught me one thing about uh, elected officials, and that was that they literally were public servants. Mm -hmm. And I have never met, nor do I ever treat an elected official other than a public servant. And I have reminded more than a few that I pay their salaries. That's right. And I pay them willingly and yes. I want them to work. But just like I work, they have to work. And I think that one of the things that uh, I want to thank the League of Women Voters for is uh, in every election past 2020, I worked not for uh, any of the candidates that we had endorsed at the Labor Council. Mm -hmm. uh, I took a lot of that time uh, after uh, the uh, 2000 election, Lord help us, uh, doing an awful lot of um, poll worker uh, work, not mm -hmm. being an actual poll worker, but an observer. and. Uh, as I'm sure this organization knows, uh, some of you anyway, I'll, I'll tell you that uh, when we had that election, uh, I also have been a member of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists for, oh God, since the early 80s or somewhere along in there. And uh, one of our things that we did was to watch polls when we uh, would Excellent. go out to vote. And we yep. did it, in, you know, we did it informally at first, but then we did it more formally mm -hmm. and it grew. And over time, uh, between the People for American Way and uh, 
funding from some other neutral organizations. Uh, there was some, uh, you know, I used to complain about uh, some of the activity that would be going on in the polls uh, when I was at the Labor Council. And when we would have uh, other meetings, I would bring these things up and I would say, you know, we'd spend an awful lot of time talking about these candidates and trying to get them elected. I said, but the one thing that we don't spend any time on is what happens to, at the polls when they get there. Yes. So uh, between uh, that uh, constant refrain on my own part, I was asked by the uh, AFL-CIO on a national level to head up uh, our election protection work here in the yep. state of Wisconsin. And I have to give a nod to our dear departed, departed friend, Carolyn Castor, who uh, I had met through Wisconsin Citizen Action, who uh, had, you know, we, we kind of coalesced around a lot of things, but one of the things that we talked about, about was this issue. And so from that, um, we worked with uh, elected officials to help pass some voting regulations. Mm -hmm. Uh, did any number of recommendations uh, based upon the things that we saw and uh, just could not believe, I'm sure you've all seen it too, the most outrageous behavior of grown people at the polling sites that I've ever seen in my life. And um, I remember when, uh, when she was just, uh, you know, one of your members, Barbara Tolles, mm -hmm. uh, was uh, <laughs> at a polling site at a Garden Homes. That was that year, 2000, or somewhere along in there. And I got to the polling site, and there was this guy running and yelling that he hadn't been allowed to vote. And when I approached Barbara, she told me, she said, well, you know, he can vote for Jesus, but he has to put him in the right in the right hand line. And he was just, <laughs> I guess, writing whatever he was doing across his ballot. I can't remember the whole thing. But I just remember uh, that took us into a different view of voting. And it got down to you know the nuts and bolts, and so uh, the more we talked about it, the better it grew, and the and the more it did grow. And it was one of the things that I had to let go of when I uh, retired because I knew that I was going to be doing the United Way campaign, and I knew that uh, in that same year I had been asked to pick up some very partisan activities, so I knew I was not going to be able to do it, and. Uh, but I, I do know this, I have encouraged and uh, helped uh, as much as I possibly could whenever I could to make sure that everyone had that right to vote. I think it's a sin and a shame that out of a county, a, a city of now, I guess a little under 600,000 people, 500, whatever the new census number is, that we have such a paltry number of people that are registered to vote. Yep. And we spend a lot of time and a lot of money in uh, trying to drive the vote out in uh, our black neighborhoods. But very little is spent on the actual process and education of the importance of that vote because that's something that's done in these off campaign years. And it becomes very difficult for smaller organizations and even larger organizations to do it because the atmosphere is so uh, tainted. But I looked back at the 2019 numbers just out of sheer curiosity. And uh, I think I have this right. I, I went to the county stats. We had 74,000, a little over 74,000 people registered to vote mm -hmm. out of hundreds of thousands of people. Mm. In that February primary, a little over 4,000 people voted. In some precincts, they were single digit numbers. One was zero, and I think they went up from there, one, two, three, whatever. Nobody went over a thousand. And in this time that we're in today, uh, I don't know what these numbers are gonna be, but one of the things that is happening to our state is this whole nonsense around, uh, you know, uh, the, our absentee voting. Now, I will say that I, too, uh, signed up uh, to get my ballot at home because mm -hmm. I didn't know what was going to happen after COVID. Right. Uh, I've always prided myself in going to the polls. However, uh, I'm on that permanent list, and I'm going to be on that list until they kick me off the list. But uh, I had encouraged 
very hard uh, in my partisan activity in 2018, everyone around me to early vote. Uh, I drilled it into candidates. I drilled it into election workers. I drilled it into anybody that was there. I said, you have no excuse not to vote. Just early vote, please early vote. That year, right before election day, we lost the president of the state AFL-CIO. He died on the Sunday before uh, the Tuesday election. When I was told, I was literally out of commission. The work that I was doing stopped. I was devastated, but my vote had been counted. On the Tuesday of the election, I could barely get out of bed. Mm, it was a horrifying day, but I had already voted. Yeah. And one of the things that I told people was, you never know. Mm -hmm. Uh, when my mother died, she died on November the 2nd. So she died just short of election day. Mm -hmm. uh, I had helped her vote uh, with, you know, uh, she had Alzheimer's, uh, but it wasn't really bad. She still knew who people were. And I remember in 2018, it was the last uh, ballot that I helped her with. So I'll say this one partisan thing on this call. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, uh, and I gave her two candidates' names, and I said, uh, who are you going to vote for? Because I was assisting. I wasn't voting for her. Right. And she said very clearly, you know <laughs> that this person would be extraordinarily mad if I didn't vote for them. Of course I'm going to vote for her. I said, OK. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> and she, we went through her ballot, and I, you know, I helped her with it. And, and I uh, witnessed it, and we got it in the mail, and, and she voted. Uh, in a major election for the last time. After that, uh, others had assisted her, but it's, it's something so sacred. Mm -hmm. Should never, ever, ever. <clears throat> yeah. Should never be uh, toyed with. Right. <clears throat> I've been spending a lot of time streaming. Uh, looking at programs and uh, <clears throat> watching things that I wouldn't ordinarily have had the chance to in all this time. Because when I worked, I worked and I worked an awful lot. So over the last few years, um, I started to uh, re-educate myself on some things. And I saw something the other night that I, I knew I was gonna say on this call. And it was uh, uh, about, um, Congressman Lewis, who I got the opportunity mm -hmm. to meet some time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it's on finding our roots. And uh, he got an opportunity to look through his roots. And like most black people, we all, for the most part, stem out of our roots are in slavery in some way, shape or form. But he found out that his, uh, I can't remember which great it was, but his great grandparents uh, did get the opportunity to vote right after slavery as free humans. Wow. Because right before we were reconstructed back into God knows what all else. Right. Um, you were, all people in the United States were able to vote freely mm -hmm. without any encumbrances. So if you could vote straight out of slavery. Yep. Uh, in 18, whatever it was, 67 or eight. I cannot understand why in the year 2022, we have to go through this kind of hell to yes. cast a vote. Yep. It's inhumane. Yep. And for those people that don't take the opportunity, I don't care what color they are, if they live in the United States, I don't care what party they are, they should be voting. If they were, we would have less of the nonsense that we see. The most mm -hmm. important election you're ever gonna vote in is this election today. Yes. These small local elections, these are the big ones. You know, there'll be those people that won't vote today and say, well, you know, we're going to vote in April. There are people that think that when they signed a uh, candidate's papers that they voted. Okay. And they really do. I've run into more than one. Uh, and I remember having an argument with a young man one day who told me, well, I already voted. I said, how could you have already voted? I mean, it's... <laughs> It's like January. And he said, well, I, I signed, uh, I signed oh. the paperwork. I said, no, honey, that's not voting. I said, all you did was say that you agreed 
with this person to be put on the ballot. I said, we haven't had that day yet. And he was so convinced that I was like, the civics lessons, the little, you know, weekly reader ballots mm -hmm. that we used to do in grade school and right. the, the parents that would take you to the polling place yes. like my yes. mother did. Those are important lessons. And those are lessons that need to be continued and lead to be learned because the generations that come after us have a lot of, uh, they have a lot on their plates. I believe that democracy works when everybody participates. Amen. And uh, that's where I've always been. I don't care what kind of election it is, be a union election at your workplace or an election for city council or, I mean, it, it, way, way, way back in my life, I used to be the secretary general of the General Baptist State Convention USA Incorporated in Wisconsin. And uh, those were elected positions too. And those are elected jobs. So these things count. We vote for a lot of things in our lives and uh, voting for our own well-being, uh, be we black, white, pink, or purple, no matter the gender, these are all important things. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity, Pat. It's been a pleasure. Oh, my goodness, Sheila. I had about 10 questions when you said you weren't going to share the screen. And as you were going forward, it was like, check, she covered that one. Oh, she went deeper into that one. Oh, this would have been a better question. <laughs> so I, I want to thank you, um, Sheila, for your sincerity, for your hard work, for your determination, and for making your parents proud. They yeah. would be so thrilled to see how their legacy lives on in you. And yours will live on in your children, too. So. Oh, yeah. um, we will open up if people are willing to unmute to um, uh, a, a note of gratitude to Sheila. And uh, at that point, I'll stop recording. I'm guessing everybody has a piece of food in their mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it's OK. I understand. <laughs> Sheila, it's, it's Peggy. Um, uh, I appreciate so much your your comments and your honesty and sincerity. And um, I want to apologize for my lapse and being unmuted. <laughs> my husband was just leaving <laughs> and I was saying goodbye to him and did not realize that happened. But um, uh, thank you. I really appreciate your being here. Oh, thank you, Peggy. I understand the I understand the unmute. I, I'm usually muted and running my mouth and not being heard. So <laughs> I, I get it. We could do it for Saturday Night Live. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we could. Well, Sheila, this is Ruth Shank, and um, I'm one of the directors on the board of directors for the state of Wisconsin. And I appreciate you coming on and sharing this with our league. And I wanted to let you know I totally understand your whole story because <laughs> i'm just a few years behind you but um it is a wonderful thing when you have an opportunity to share with people what is important within their companies within their um communities and all of that and personally i was thankful when a global corporation hired me and part of what they wanted me to do was to help with making sure that their community, their community within their organization was more integrated and more um, equitable. And um, I didn't expect it, but they had me on the board with their partners trying to get everyone to understand how important it is to work together and understand one another because that is for the good of the company as well as the good of the people who are the human capital of that company. So I appreciate you sharing those thoughts and some of those ideas. And um, I get your story. <laughs> I kind of been, <laughs> been yeah, there. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think it's a, uh... I think when it comes down to black people and especially black women, it is not an uncommon story. It's a very, uh, it's one of those things where, you know how it is when you walk in the room and you kind of look around for the other black person. It's like, oh, okay, I'm good. 
<laughs> or when you walk into a boardroom and oh God, yeah. first thing, you know, they kind of like, oh my goodness, you know, <laughs> yeah. person because yeah. they talked to you on the phone, but they weren't sure who you were. <laughs> and you walk into this room full of these very wealthy gentlemen. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'll just say gentlemen. And yes. you open your mouth and they're like, oh my God. My God. Yes. <laughs> she is really an intelligent person. <laughs> <laughs> but we need to keep it up. We need to keep it up. Yeah. For all of us. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it is, it is, a, it is funny. I, I can tell you, I, I, I told this, uh, I say it all the time and I swear it is so true. Uh, I never walked into a room where I, I just assumed and it was, it was the best posture I could take. I see, you know, I walk in all these boardrooms and I just assume I'm totally hated. And I really don't care past there. Uh, and that didn't matter what boardroom it was, by the way. So, and I've been in a lot of boardrooms. Uh, I had to laugh when I saw uh, Pat try and pull together a little resume for me because I would never put my bio online for the labor council. <laughs> uh, and I would edit out a lot of things that I was doing because at some point, uh, it was my daughter, she said, are you, she said, do you do all this stuff? I said, yes. I said, but the way I do it, I said, it works. I said, so we, you know, so she would like, that's a lot of stuff. I said, yeah, it is a lot of stuff because she had to help me rewrite it. And uh, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I've been in a, in a lot of, I, I will say this, and this is, I'm intentionally not mentioning organizations. Uh, I did sit in one boardroom. Uh, I put my stuff down and uh, I had walked away and I had had to come straight at the time I worked at Delco Electronics and I, head of my factory guard and I walked straight in uh, and dropped my stuff and then I went back and I was talking to a friend of mine who had begged me to be on this board by the way and uh, when I came in and I sat down uh, the gentleman whose stuff was sitting there already he took one he took one look at me and he picked his stuff up and he walked away and he went across the other side of the room now <clears throat> I you know what <clears throat> at this point I was just you know I just sat there and did what I had to do and it was done. And then uh, the woman who his, the, was the current uh, executive director at the time came over and sat next to me and said, oh, this is Sheila Cochran. This is the person I've been telling you about. And we just wanted her to be on our board and blah, blah, blah. And she went on and on and on. And I sat there and I watched this poor man just turn as red as a beet. Uh -huh. And uh, he was uh, the president of one of our major corporations. And I will only say that uh, after having, uh, after we got to know each other, uh, we would meet at his uh, place of business on occasion. We were doing some uh, community type, I mean, uh, sidebar uh, uh, committee work. Uh, we got to the point where it was the year of the Atlanta Olympics and he was going to the Olympics. And so we were teasing him and said, oh, you're gonna go to the Olympics and leave us here. And he said, yeah. And then he said, okay, so I'm gonna tell you right now, Sheila is in charge of this group uh, when I, until I get back. And uh, she has the full access of the organization, blah, 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 and his secretary. And I just said to myself, oh, how the worm has turned. <laughs> it was, it was uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been that and it's been other stuff, but yeah, it, I, it is, uh, it's like anything else. I, I think the more people really get to honestly know each other, the less threatening we are to each other. And uh, it was, you know, it was, it was not, it's, it's from, you know, I'll be honest, it's, it's more comfortable for me uh, to live within an all black community than it is a necessary uh, integrated community. But I was very intentional about that because I had to bring a daughter up in this world. And uh, I remember she, uh, she went to Nicolay High School uh, she, my mother had insisted she be part of the 220 system. And when she got to Nicolay's, my daughter was so vocal, she scared me, I'll put that way. <laughs> and so she said to me one day, these people are racist, they're this and this, and I want to go to Rufus King. I said, no, dear, you're not going to Rufus King. You are going to learn how to deal with it where you are. You yes. will have to deal with it your entire life. So you better learn now. And uh, trust and believe she did learn. So uh, I think that uh, it's the only way we learn. Uh, it's, you know, what do they say? The most segregated day of the week is Sunday. Right. Uh, and uh, it's that way for a, a reason because we, you know, we, we tend not to want to do that, but we do have to learn to live with each other because uh, one of the stats that I learned when I was chair of the MATC board and we were 
going through our varying machinations was uh, we, we, we went to a, an association meeting and we talked about demographics and we talked about the demographics of the coming workforce. And there's a year out there, not too far from now, where the United States is going to be more brown than it is white. That's and right. I think that, that is exactly what is wrong with what is going on now. We have, uh, we have, a, we have a country that is frightened uh, where we say the minority will become the majority. And I will say this about that. Uh, in the law, there are certain words that say minority this, minority that, minority this. It does not spell out uh, an individual. It says minority. When the minority flips and the minority is white, we will have just a bigger problem as we have right now. So we have laws that need to be changed and wording that needs to be fixed. Will it get fixed in that time? I doubt it. but. Uh, it's something as an activist who, who I, you know, I've self-educated myself a little bit on some of the stuff that I really had to know for sure. And uh, there's an awful lot of legalese in legal briefs uh, that leads me to believe that, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So, yeah. And we're going to do it, Sheila. We're going to do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I know it'll get done. I may not see it to get done, but then again, I didn't think I'd see a black president. Saw that, got a black VP, saw that. <laughs> I might get a chance to see a black female Supreme Court justice. Right. I'm, like, I'm looking forward to that. So me that too. was a happy day for me. <laughs> it was a happy me day. Too. Um, Mary Gleason, looks like you're unmuted. Did you want to put in a word? Yes, just thank you, Sheila. Um, you're you're just riveting. I feel like I could listen to you all day long. So I just want to thank you for the, the incredible lessons you've learned um, so deeply and the information that you have to share. And I'm so happy that someone exactly like you is doing the work you're doing. Um, and I just, it, it's been a gift to listen to you today. So I just want to thank you for being exactly who you are. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. I'm, I'm glad for that because, you know, I've been cooped up here in the house with not a whole heck of a lot to do. So when I start talking, sometimes it's hard to turn me off. <laughs> <laughs> no need to turn you off. Um, I was going to end unless somebody, um, I'm not ending the meeting. I just wanted to um, share this with you. Um, so if that's true, then let's widen the circle until it breaks. For as long as the circle exists, pieces and parts of ourselves will always lie on the other side of the line. So let us push, pull, twist and tear, dig underneath and climb over the top, do whatever it takes to meet each other face to face. And having found each other, let us stare and struggle, fight and forgive, call in and call out until me and you dissolves into us. Is there any other way we can become whole? So with that, I will thank Sheila again and look forward to when COVID allows us to have some coffee time. Let's do it, <laughs> girlfriend. <laughs> oh, no problem, trust me, <laughs> no problem at all. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you everyone. And with that, I am going to end the meeting and end the recording. I wish you all well. Help us turn out the vote, help us defend democracy and help us make sure that we are dealing with the shenanigans that's getting in the way, may it be so. Peace be sure. with you. And with you. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone have a blessed day. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.